Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm James Haft, co-founder. It's okay. They'll get there. They'll get there. Um, James Haft, co-founder of Crypto Oracle, my, with my partner Luke Herner. Uh, we're Community First VC, and we're very proud to be hosting the security token track here tonight. This is the last panel of the day, um, and we're here to talk about the future of Wall Street's participation in the blockchain and crypto, which really is an important subject if you're looking for the, you know, for the mass adoption and the institutionalization of the, of the asset class, uh, Wall Street is going to play a part in it whether you want it to or not. Um, so first, why don't we just say hello and introduce ourselves? Which I like people do it themselves. So, David, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, David Weald, uh, my, my notoriety is uh, people call me father of the Jobs Act for uh, so things like 506C, the repeal of the prohibition against general solicitation, got lifted out of one of our white papers, testified on Regulation A, and actually a lot of the provisions there came from back when it was uh, H, uh, 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 before it even got wrapped into the Jobs Act. And then I was vice chairman of NASDAQ, uh, running a new model investment bank. Uh, we do some uh, 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 blockchain, uh, we have blockchain clients, probably, I don't know, about eight or nine engagements at this point. And so we're active in the space and continue to work down in Washington to advance capital formation to better support entrepreneurship and uh, job growth. Love it. Hi, my name is Monette Stevens. I run uh, corporate development for Tokensoft. We're a white label back end um, issuance infrastructure platform. So we do everything from registering the investors all the way through document review and signing, payment processing in crypto, as well as fiat. And um, token issuance, we're blockchain agnostic and we're really highly scalable, secure, um, and compliant. We can run concurrent Reg D, Reg S sales. We can run an international sale um, alongside a, um, a US uh, regulated sale. And we've been taking in investors from upwards of 170 countries. We can handle um, entities differently than individuals. So we're just pretty much a full service back end uh, platform. We've done some really interesting sales. Personally, I have degrees in computer science and electrical engineering. My graduate work was actually in uh, queuing theory and temporal logic, um, which if you guys know what that means, then you probably know how that applies. <laughs> and I also co-founded and ran a broker dealer um, that merged with a larger broker dealer. Michael? Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Graham. I um, work at Canaccord Genuity. Canaccord is a growth-oriented investment banking firm. We're publicly traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, about a billion dollars in market value. Uh, we also have um, a big business in the U.S. that's about the same size as our Canadian business, and uh, we have about 2,000 institutional investor accounts that trade with our firm. Uh, everything from the biggest, you know, Wellington and Fidelities of the world all the way down to small uh, hedge funds. Um, we also manage about $60 billion in private wealth assets in, in Canada and Europe. Um, so, um, you know, our main business is, uh, is IPOs and, and trading. Um, and we are also, you know, heavily involved in blockchain and crypto. Uh, I w have been an internet and technology analyst for over 20 years and have participated in a whole bunch of internet related IPOs over the years and, uh, you know, definitely our firm sees blockchain as a great opportunity. Um, so we're supposed to talk about the future of Wall Street and uh, tokens, but let's start with the current, where we are today. Michael, from where you sit, you're an investment bank, you're an you're ish advisor to, to these transactions. Are you welcoming the transactions? Uh, is there a platform where you can actually execute them? And is there demand? Yeah, um, you know, we, we break up the, the crypto markets into a few different uh, segments. Uh, the first is Bitcoin specifically. Um, uh, the second is um, other uh, 
you know, utility tokens and other, other types of tokens that aren't Bitcoin. And then, you know, the next one is securities tokens. And um, we have about five different classes of investors from the big institutions through family offices, through our, you know, individuals that manage their wealth on their behalf. And um, what we're seeing right now is um, essentially there's decent interest in these big investors getting exposure to Bitcoin because as a, a lot of us know in the room, when you add a small Bitcoin position to a diversified equity portfolio, you get higher risk adjusted uh, returns um, because Bitcoin's you know uncorrelated with, with equities markets. Uh, basically, the larger you go in institution size, the less interest there is, you know, the smaller hedge funds, the family offices, like they're super interested. Uh, you know, over time, we see the, the big institutions is definitely getting more interested. Um, when you work your way down to the other asset classes, you know, part of the uh, basis that I'm sort of communicating this is we regularly survey a big chunk of our clients, both the wealth management clients and the institutional clients, uh, regarding their readiness for uh, for crypto investments. And basically, um, when you get to bigger investors, they don't have that appetite for Bitcoin yet. I think they will. Um, you know, a lot of the custody solutions and everything else that we've been talking about all day are an important part of that. And then the last thing I'll say is. Just on the on the securities tokens, um, there are definitely pockets of interest. Uh, you know, I really agree. It, it's still fairly limited at this point. I would say, um, I really agree with some of the points that were made in the previous panel, which is like it's not the first deal or the third deal um, that is going to get a lot of interest from institutions, but it's the tenth and the twentieth deals, and so um, we're sort of focused on trying to make sure we're in a position to impact that. And, and David, could you put this into a historical perspective? You know, wh when new asset classes come in and new concepts for liquidity are coming into the markets, how does the in how does the institutional part of the market react? Well, the, well, the institutional market is very risk averse. You know, you've got you've got deep pockets, and uh, you can't afford to get it wrong. Uh, if you go to uh, Morgan Stanley, you can look it up online. They have a they have franchise committees, and for every penny change in Morgan Stanley's uh, um, equity market value, it's 17 and a half million. You lose a buck because you get some kind of a whiff of scandal in the marketplace. You've just lost 175 million dollars in value. They just, uh, there's no rush to get into the market unless all of a sudden you start to fear that your assets are moving out of the retail side of the business or uh, that institutions are pressuring you to do it. And I think as, you know, as uh, my, my co-panelist pointed out, I mean, the, the people are concerned on the institutional side with custody. So I think this is pretty, um, I mean, if you go back through what happened during the dot-com era, uh, for a long time that market was driven by retail investors, and it was kind of an anomaly. We had that structural shift where all of a sudden we had a direct you know, in investment through the E-Trades of the world, and there was massive growth in E-Trade accounts, just like we've seen in terms of cyber wallets, mostly with retail. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't until uh, the institutional investors started to lag the performance in the overall market that they felt compelled to get into the market and that took the market up second leg. But here, you know, we're issuing completely new securities. You're not participating in the broader, you know, stock market. So I don't feel like there's any of that pressure and until we suss out the risks, I don't think the institutions are going to come in in a big way. I, I agree with you. I mean, you can look at it, Bitcoin as sort of an asset class in its own right as a cyber currency, but, you know, sort of everything else right now is, is too small and not interesting enough for the major institutions to take a risk. And, and the exchanges, how, how, how do they look at these assets? Well, I think that there's a lot of you know a lot of volume, and I think exchanges are uh, you know are, are are interested in moving in that direction. But you know there are so many entry new entrants coming into this market right now to trade that you know I, I think you I think you monitor and you acquire is what I would do. I mean, I was you know, as I said, I was vice, I mean you know I'm vice I was vice chairman of Nasdaq. You have to have something material to move that earnings per share needle, and so you know you can you can play. A Around. They have a venture fund. It's actually run by a fellow who is a former head of the direct, uh, the strategic investment group at Morgan Stanley. Now, um, but I don't think that uh, un until uh, until there's really sort of volume and the kinks are worked out, 
uh, that there's any reason to get into the market, and I would, if I was, if I was a CEO, and I know Adina Friedman, who is a CEO of Nasdaq, I'd probably acquire my way in. Interesting. And Monette, you, you're working with the investment banks to try and help them accept the asset, right? Uh, well, we're working with um, institutions in a number of ways. Uh, a lot of the institutions I've been talking to uh, and some of the largest institute, financial institutions in the U.S. as well as globally are looking at tokenization as a way and as, at blockchain as a way to be able to decrease costs and increase their efficiency for different financial products that they're developing. So they're looking at the different um, blockchains that are focused on the financial sector and doing different um, pilots, or I don't even want to call them pilots, they're doing initial issuances. So if you look at what World Bank and Commonwealth Bank of Australia are doing, they're doing, I, I can't remember the number, 100 million-ish, I think, um, you know, bond issuance on, um, I can't remember which, uh, which blockchain they're doing it on. And, you know, we're involved with a lot of these different projects um, at different levels. The other thing that we've been seeing a lot of are asset managers who are looking at tokenizing different uh, funds and then being able to offer that either equity or debt-backed um, issuances. And then as part of what we're doing post-issuance, uh, we work really closely both with the crypto exchanges as well as looking at what the standard um, exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange NASDAQ, the London Stock Exchange, Swiss, SIX, as well as Malta, Gibraltar. I mean, a lot of the stock exchanges, I, I'm keep, keep going, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, Singapore, um, are looking at incorporating, you know, uh, uh, crypto as well as, you know, different issuances t in their, you know, trading platforms. So, with one of the things we've done recently is um, put forth the ERC-1404 standard, which supports secondary market, uh, compliant secondary market trading. So when we're working with issuers, we, you know, we are trying to help them, um, you know, strategize that so that they're going to be able to, you know, trade their tokens on the secondary market. Is that private markets, public markets, or both? Uh, both. Yeah. So simultaneously. Public, well, it depends on on how it's being issued. I mean, so we are the way that um, TokenSoft. The, what what we've done is we got involved with um, ICOs and realized that there was really no platform that was supporting global issuances in a really compliant way that was enforcing different um, compliance in different jurisdictions uniquely. And so that's, that's what we built. And then we take our direction from the SEC, from the, um, the legal counsel for the issuers to determine, you know, how it needs to be enforced. And so we, we, we follow on it. We do that. That's what our back, that's what we do. Uh, Does that make sense? The, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, mo most uh, if, you, if you're doing an issuance in the United States, most of these things are going to be done as typically 506C private placements <clears throat> initially with a reg S bucket to distribute outside to foreign jurisdictions where, uh, where, where there tends to be a little bit uh, more openness, at least in the European market. So I would, you know, uh, just are you, are you, are you kind of keeping track of the back end in, in that yeah. instance? So that those Reg S shares are not coming back into the U.S.? Yeah, so, you or know, tokens, as well as, say. yeah, and as well as holding periods for, you know, Reg S versus Reg D. The other thing is what we've done, um, or what some we've seen, is some of the issuers are actually doing an international issuance, not a Reg S, so outside of the U.S., and then they're running a U.S. offering under, you know, Reg D. So, yeah, and then we can, we keep track of that. Um, so that the secondary markets, um, you're not uh, trading uh, tokens that were issued under, you know, either an international sale or a Reg S sale, you know, with U.S. investors. So you end up with two pools for a period of time before you can merge them. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Michael, uh, how do you see the path forward? You know, which, which securities, offering types, uh, what kind of products are going to start to come first and as the, as the dam starts to erode before it breaks, you know, how, how do you see that happening? Yeah, um, I think that it's most likely from our perspective that Bitcoin sort of trains the institutional investor to own tokens. Um, gets them you know, set up with custody solutions, gets them set up with working with their LPs to get permission to own tokens. I mean, it's a, there's a lot that goes into you know, taking an equity fund and um, getting the permission and the capability to uh, add a 5% you know, position in, in, in Bitcoin or whatever, right? So I think Bitcoin's gonna train these organizations. I think um, it's gonna take some time, uh, you know, probably we could be here next year and you know if the percentage of sort of traditional equity asset managers that owns bitcoin right now is you know way less than one you know i would imagine it's going to be you know way less than 10 percent by next year i have no idea but um and then and then i think what we're what i'm hoping to see is that um you're going to see a whole bunch of security tokens um come out that uh, you know, sort of fit the bill of some of the things that people up on the stage have been talking about. It's a, it's an, in a, it's a new uh, investment idea. It's high quality. Maybe it brings liquidity to an asset class where liquidity, you know, hasn't really been there before. Like real estate is a great example. Um, you know, maybe the tokens have uh, particular uh, governance capabilities, or maybe they have um, really good um, shareholder-friendly, you know, distribution mechanisms. Like whatever it is. You know things that make those securities attractive relative to other types of securities, um, and and then I think um, after that, and you know much longer term, we're likely to see a wave of more sciency, blockchainy, utility type tokens uh, in the market that. Um, that are solving problems and it looks like a SaaS, you know, like a software upgrade cycle for enterprises and everybody else and, you know, that's going to take a long time. Um, so that's kind of the way we see it evolving. And David, do you see the major houses starting to look at these types of offerings as security tokens look more and more like shares? Do you, th do you think this becomes a product that complements or replaces share offerings? Not yet. Um, they need to be larger, they need to be scale, and uh, they need to work, and they need to be largely de-risked, and uh, I don't think we're there yet. I think that, um, you know, you kind of have to ask the question, what is tokenization doing for you? I, I kind of totally disagree with the last panel in the sense of, you know, creating liquidity, and when you're looking at micro little, you know, issuances, they're not going to be innately liquid, because you have the same problem you do with micro cap securities when, you know, an academic will say, you got, they call them asymmetrical order book markets, big seller, no buyer. And you really need an intermediary in the middle providing research and sales support to make those, those tokens or those securities liquid. And so, uh, but what I think, where I think it does become really interesting is, you know, you're, you, when you're looking at the protocol and the application layer, the things where you actually get rid of a lot of the legal paperwork, uh, in particularly in private markets, you can you can facilitate, you can get rid of all the the legal kind of constipation and automate a lot of that away. I think that's really interesting. But the issuers, if you Barry Silbert, who was a uh, uh, founder of Digital Currency Fund, and I, you know, I was advising Barry back when he was doing uh, second markets, and um, and you know what they learned there was that they were trading, making markets in in unicorns, effectively like Facebook before Facebook was public, and uh, and and they found that issuers really didn't want to lose control of their trading because what happens with micro, micro cap or you know, illiquid markets, opaque markets, is they tend to trade to a discount. And of course, that's anathema to doing the next round you know, in, in the case of a unicorn. You wanna, you wanna manage the rounds, the A, B, C, D prices. And so where you started to go was uh, into, a, into a structure where there were tenders that were controlled by the CFO and they, they controlled where those where those were uh, were going off at, and they they'd work with a an institution who wanted to back up the truck and and own the security. I think that what where where this technology becomes really interesting is I think that a lot of the the paperwork 
kind of starts to go away and gets automated in the application layer. And I think that that's, that's actually very interesting for the private market over the long run. But it's going to take a while for that to get adopted. And it's not till the, the, the companies get really large that I think you're going to start to see uh, institutional investors cross over into those private markets. I, I just reinforce that, like liquidity is huge. I mean, when you're talking to a portfolio manager about a thinly traded, you know, stock, they don't really want to entertain it, especially if it's, you know, a, a book of any decent size. So uh, it's going to take liquidity building slowly, um, you know, over time for this to work. Um, and so um, your father, the Jobs Act, um, and so crowdfunding, which is the whole idea of collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer decentralization, the idea of, 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 of going to the, the wisdom of the crowd for investments, is part of the core belief for crypto and blockchain world. How do you see that interplaying into what's happening right now? And do you think the Jobs Act and A+, and all the other ways that, are, that have come through Washington are helpful and going to be useful in this process, or do you think they're just going to be... You know, I don't want to put, I don't want to put a conclusion. Yeah, I mean, but there was a, in the Jobs Act 3.0 that just went through the House uh, in a vote of 410 to 4. It's 32 elements in, 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 that, in that particular bill. It hasn't made it to the Senate. One of the more interesting ones is the venture exchange legislation that essentially rolls back a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, requirements of today's public markets that, that gutted the sales incentives and the trading incentives for uh, market makers, okay? And market makers are essential in whether it's tokens or it's stocks. Until you get to a certain size and because of so-called network effects where you've got thousands and thousands of investors looking at a token or a security simultaneously, that there's innate liquidity. Intel is innately liquid. Just get out of the way and let the orders interact. Uh, Exxon Mobil, innately liquid. But when you get into these, you know, micro cap issuances, they're not innately, li innately liquid and there has to be a mechanism to drive that liquidity. I mean, there are folks out there working on, for instance, artificial intelligence solutions to provide uh, information on real estate properties. Why? Because you want to be able to look at the value. It's got a yield associated with it. But that stuff's not going to trade with any kind of velocity. But people may, you know, chip away at it on the shelf. It may be that may emerge because of because people will look at the yield. But if you're looking at a at a at a stock, I mean, or you know, a company, an operating company token, um, and it's it's small, it's in the it should be in the private placement market. It's it's not going to trade very well. I mean, continuous offering markets are are really sort of anathema to that kind of uh, that kind of a. A security. I mean, in, in the long run, we just have to keep chipping away at, um, from a public policy standpoint to create toolkits that get more of that $30 trillion in equity assets that are in the, in the institutional market and to bring it down into the micro cap markets to get the small IPOs to come back again. They used to represent 80%, defined as sub $50 million in, in size, probably $85 million in, in, uh, if you go all the way back to the 90s and control for inflation. Uh, they represented 80% of all IPOs. It's down below 20%, right? So to get that, you know, to get, to bring those back, that would be the real opportunity and that will then spread wealth and capital into all private placements, whether they're tokens or securities. That's the big, that's, that's the big uh, uh, sort of secular change that needs to occur. Mike, I, I wanted to come back to you because I, I want to, do you believe that we can get back to democratized markets? I mean. <laughs> yeah, just a super quick, you know, build on that. Like, like one of the major things that's uh, pushed um, the IPO market, you know, further out in the form company formation is, is the rise of private equity. I mean, we always talk about the major force in the equities markets being the shift to passive investing and how that's, um, you know, causing a lot of correlation of returns and less volatility in the markets. But the other big thing has been that private equity uh, funds under management have grown you know, massively over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. And um, those products have been really successful. But what that's done is it's, it's had these investors create a really vibrant private market, allowing companies to stay private, stay off the public markets for a lot longer, especially in the technology and healthcare sectors. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is can the STO market, uh, you know, bring some private, 
equity oriented money into new types of products that are sort of outside of the traditional VC industry and you know as David said like maybe create a little more of a smaller offering you know thing which which we would love to see. That, that would also entail a, a change in the marketing strategy of Canaccord and the other big banks, right? Because right now you're marketing to institutions, not really in individuals. Well, um, we, we do have a big wealth management business. We, you know, we, we obviously have a bigger business with institutions. Um, you know, I think at the core, we're, we're trying to um, help, help uh, worthy issuers access capital and, uh, you know, and also provide good returns for our investor clients as well. You know, I think that, um, uh, you can, you know, the, the, the smaller and less liquid the investments are, the more likely you're going to have inefficiencies in the market that our investor clients can exploit and make outsized returns. So I think, it, you know, a, a paradigm like this where we sort of get away from big and big private equity, you know, probably helps in the smart investor, you know, d do a little better. And Monette, in the, in the offerings that you guys are handling, are you see, what's the balance you're seeing? In, what, what's the demographics of the investor base? Um, well, we're seeing a lot of larger private investors um, and institutions, family offices. Uh, and then it depends on the type of the sale. Uh, we've done <clears throat> some broader sales where there have been, you know, a larger number of investors, but internationally. We did one sale that was based out of Australia where we brought in around 28,000 investors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a pretty diverse uh, investor pool. What we're seeing with a lot of our larger sales, <coughs> particularly the private sales, um, and so we'll often work with a company from a, when they're doing their initial pre-sales, which is usually targeted to a small number of investors. Uh, and usually those are, you know, larger investors, venture capitalists, you know, VCs, whatever. Um, and then they'll do a broader private sale, but it's also to a set of, you know, accredited investors if it's, you know, domestic. Um, and that's, and again, we're seeing uh, larger uh, investor uh, entities and pools that are that are investing in that. So, you know, it just really depends on the type of the sale, uh, what we see. And you know, we've done some issuances that have been very broad. Um, and I'm not really sure what I can talk about, so I'm, I'm being a little, little bit, bit cagey. Uh, name I companies. Apologize. <laughs> um, so, uh, David, how much of the holdup right now is the regulatory opacity, and, and how much of it is a lack of demand? Well, I don't think there is any regulatory opacity. Okay. I mean, I, three months before Jay Clayton came out and said he hadn't seen, this is the SEC chair, and said he hadn't seen a, an ICO yet that he didn't think was a securities offering, we told everybody in our investment bank that we were going to treat them all as securities right. offerings. I mean, so you, you know, you've got reg, you know, reg D, you've got a couple of flavors that are relevant. It's 506B, which is uh, where you know the accredited investors that you're going to, and you do an institutional or, you know, typically quid placement, but also you can go to accredited investors if you have individuals if you have those relationships where you do a generally solicited private placement and it has a different uh, a, a more burdensome mechanism because you need a third party to verify their accredited investor status then reg a um, you know you can use uh, actually most of the reg a offerings that are getting done right now they're restricting under the shareholder uh, rights agreements, the trading, and so I think about 80% of them are non-traded, but they're publicly reporting. A lot of it's being applied to real estate, and then, uh, you know, but you, you know, one of the problems if you try and list in the United States on a major exchange, you have to worry about uh, 12G because it still requires once you're once you're trading, still you're still required to have a uh, transfer agent, which the block arguably, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it sub substitutes for. And so I think the SEC is being in that particular area very deliberate about, because uh, they, they want to make sure that they don't make a mistake and waive something, and so everything is vetted. This is the I mean, I, I remember speaking at a, at a panel a while back, it was in February, and somebody asked me, what did I think of all these exchanges that were trading these uh, cyber currencies? And I said, most of them are illegal. And, um, you know, you, there, there is a well-oiled regulatory and review mechanism for securities. There's, you know, laws and the tokens 
that people are issuing, or if it's a currency, the CFTC, the, the rules are there, the principles are there, follow the rules, follow the principles, at least in the United States, otherwise it's going to end badly for you. Uh, Michael, uh, again, the balance between the, 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 the friction, is it regulatory side or demand side? I, I, I agree with the comment that there's, I don't think there's regulatory opacity. I think, you know, there was when people were trying to not follow the securities laws. Um, to me, it, it's about demand and, you know, demand is going to develop when investors can earn superior risk adjusted returns from investing in this asset class relative to other asset classes. And so, you know, the two or three key words are risk adjusted and returns, right? And, you know, returns is driven from uh, we need to have good ideas, good projects, good companies that are growing, taking market share from traditional companies or industries or doing things in a fundamentally better way that, you know, is attracting customers and just growing, right? Um, and then risk adjusted, we got to have liquidity. And, and so until, you know, as those things build over time, uh, you know, and, and you know, you, you're a Wall Street veteran too, James. I mean, you've seen this, like, a lot of times it's a killer app that can come out and develop and sort of cause a tsunami to start to happen. Um, you know, in the, in the case of digital advertising, uh, you know, like Yahoo did really well for a while, but it didn't really change the game until Google came around and applied, you know, automatic algorithm, you know, learning and, you know, the search algorithm just sort of fed on itself. And that's, you know, it was only 10 years ago, it, you know, Yahoo had more search share than Google, right? And then all of a sudden, they just opened the floodgates and that's really when the digital ad markets took off and now Google and Facebook are, you know, half of the global ad market. So um, it could be that we just need one great idea, one great project to come in and just fuel the whole thing. Killer app, I agree with that. Yeah. But, so these guys won't take the bait. I'm trying to go to one app. Regulatory or demand? <laughs> In terms of what's holding up being, you know, bigger offerings, more liquidity, things moving forward. <clears throat> um, well, I mean, I, I'm not a regulator. <laughs> no, but I'm saying from your experience in dealing with, with offerings, you're the only one yeah. up here actually doing offerings right now. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we're seeing, um, the thing I think that's holding it up at this point really is people's, um, or companies, hesitance about what's going on from a regulatory perspective in the market. And we're seeing a lot of issuances, we're seeing a lot of interest internationally. Uh, we don't do a lot of work in Asia, although we do do some work in Asia, we're seeing a lot of interest in Europe, uh, particularly, you know, Switzerland and, and, um, and in that area. But, and actually Australia, we're seeing a lot of um, interest there as well. Uh, but what we've seen with kind of a little bit of a bear market in crypto is that people are waiting longer and wanting to do a little bit smaller initial issuances. And the one thing that's really changed um, for us over the last year, and we've worked on around 20 issuances over the past year, um, is that people are waiting a little bit longer to go out to market and they're also taking traditional um, investment initially. So they're raising capital as equity first and then doing um, an issuance. And, you know, but that, that's like, that's different than the funds and asset managers that are just looking at tokenizing and, and offering a tokenized financial instrument, so. Um, I mean, it's, it's performance, right? I mean, the, you know, the cryptos, you know, had a had a, a little bit of a collapse there. It's settled out. ICOs are the vast majority of them are underwater. If investors make money, there'll be demand. Demand will grow. If investors don't make money, they won't. But there was a, an enormous tsunami of complete crap <laughs> that came into the market. You know, if you read through a lot of these white papers, there were no risk factors sections. You really didn't know what you were buying half the time. What was, it, what was the economic bargain? I mean, and so from a disclosure standpoint, the, the industry, and it's been written about, you know, in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere, was rife with fraud, at least from the standpoint of material, um, the legal standard of material omissions in fact, and it went to the public. So, you know, so we're gonna have to kind of digest the crap, and you know, and, I, and our, my colleague here was was making a, 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 the very very good point. It's it's the quality of what people 
are selling the quality of the business models, the quality, the stage of development. You, you, most, most of what you saw in the kind of the early wave, people didn't even didn't even have a mock-up, a demo of what they were providing. I mean, this stuff was was complete startup fare that never should have been sold to the public to begin with, but people threw caution to the wind and, and somehow deluded themselves into thinking that the securities laws did not apply, and guess what? They do apply. Yeah, we've been very careful from day one to, <clears throat> and Mason was on a panel, our CEO, earlier where he said that he spends a lot of time you know, trying to dissuade people. And so we've been very careful from day one, really only taking clients that are you know, doing something substantial. And a lot of our business comes in through the securities attorneys. And so when someone really comes into, you know, where we're gonna actually work with them, usually they are relatively um, substantial in terms of what they're doing. Again, we work on larger issuances. We have a minimum threshold um, under which we're not really going for a number of different reasons. Um, What's that minimum? <clears throat> I, I'm not going to disclose that <laughs> uh, right now. Um, but we're, we're pretty careful. But what that's done is we've seen and we've run and we've handled um, all of our issuances since our inception as security offerings. And so we have followed, you know, protocol in terms of taking investors through KYC, AML, OFAC checks, U.S. investors through investor verification. Um, if we're doing an issuance out of Switzerland, let's say, there might be an additional um, requirement for the KYC where they have to do, you know, a time-stamped, you know, photo that is then compared against their, um, documents that they upload. So, you know, our focus has been to run, you know, compliant, regulated issuances and enforcing the regulatory environment for wherever either the investor or the issuer is, um, is coming out of. So, you know, we're trying to stay close with what's going on in the, um, you know, in the regulatory community. And, and in a way, that's just, we see that that's just the way we think it's going to go. All right. <clears throat> One word answer. Sorry. Last I'm questions. Sorry. Okay. Um, bull or bear on security token market over the next three to five years? Bull or bear? Bull. Want that? Uh, bull. Okay. You had to say that. <laughs> David? Slow bull. Okay. <laughs> all right, guys. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, James.